John Frankenheimer was in good form when I spoke to him about Ronin and about some of the films, including The Manchurian Candidate, Seconds, and Seven Days in May, which established his reputation at the forefront of American cinema in the 60s. We started with stunts and cars. These actors were very brave because they were all in the cars, going at that speed. I mean, there's no simulated stuff in this. There's no, no computers, no... Uh, we didn't undercrank the cameras or anything like that. I mean, what you really see is what happened. And uh, it was tough. I mean, I had a great stunt coordinator, a guy named uh, Jean-Claude Lagnez, who's a French race driver and movie stunt coordinator. And uh, his drivers were wonderful. And don't forget, I did Grand Prix. I used to be a race driver. So for me, it was kind of revisiting familiar territory. Frankenheimer's 1966 Grand Prix was innovative for its use of split-screen technique. I had seen this film at the New York World's Fair, uh, Johnson's Wax, where the guy had used that. And I thought, wow, what a good idea. Because I've got these parallel stories to tell, and I've got all these details of racing to try and explain to an audience, like heel towing and double clutching and shifting of gears and suspension and all that kind of stuff, which don't warrant being on the screen by themselves, but if you can combine them with other things, how good? The Manchurian Candidate, made in 1962, is Frankenheimer's most acclaimed film. It's a thriller about brainwashing, starring Lawrence Harvey and Frank Sinatra. The subject matter was turned down by every studio in town. George Axelrod and I got together on a picture called Breakfast at Tiffany's, which um, it turns out that I didn't end up directing for the fact that Audrey Hepburn wanted somebody else. It was supposed to be originally with Marilyn Monroe. When they cast Hepburn, I got fired. Paid off, but fired. Um, but Axelrod and I stayed friends, and we were determined that we wanted to work together. And he asked me if I ever had read this book by Richard Condon, which I said I hadn't. We read it together. We bought it that afternoon. And it turns out Sinatra had always really wanted to do it. Again, the same story. Once we got Sinatra, suddenly we got United Artists. And Axelrod wrote a wonderful script. And again, uh, all the cast just fell right into place. And we shot the movie in Los Angeles and in New York. And uh, the shooting schedule for the movie was 41 days. The budget in those days, including paying Sinatra two, uh, $750,000, was $2 million three. Tell me, Raymond, have you ever killed anyone? No, ma'am. Not even in combat? In combat? Yes, ma'am, I think so. <laughs> of course you have, Raymond. Raymond has been a crack shot since childhood. Marvelous outlet for his aggression. May I have the bayonet, please? Well, it was very complicated to do. It comes really right out of Condon. It's in the book. But what was complicated was really the time involved because what we had to do was shoot about six versions of each scene. So then it became a question of editing after that. After we got by the first shot, the 360 degree shot, which was done by putting the stages of both sets on a railroad track so that you started with the New Jersey Hotel as the camera started to pan around, uh, obviously the sound was cut and the actors jumped off the stage, the railroad track, there were grips on it that pushed the other set in. The actors jumped onto the other set and as the camera came around, they were on the other set. So once we got that in the audience's mind that this was a continuous thing, then we were free to cut everywhere. My dear girl, have you noticed that the human race is divided into two distinct and irreconcilable groups? Those who walk into rooms and automatically turn television sets on, and those who walk into rooms and automatically turn them off. <laughs> I come out of live television, and television was very much a, a, a part of our life. And I just thought that uh, we should incorporate that as much as we possibly could, and I knew how to do that. I mean, because as I say, that's what I come from. And uh, one has a tendency to revert to one's uh, strength in life, you know. Burt Lancaster starred in several Frankenheimer films, including the political thriller Seven Days in May. He was wonderful. He was a, perhaps the most professional human being I've ever known. He really knew a lot about everybody's job, and you really had to get up early in the morning when you were working with Burt. You didn't want to go on the set not knowing what you were doing. He expected everybody to do the best they could because he did the best he could. He was the best stuntman that ever lived. He came out of the circus. He did all his own stunts on the train on whatever there were on Birdman of Alcatraz. 
On the Gypsy Moss, he did everything but jump out of the airplane. He was in the airplane with a cable attached to him up there. He was a very brave guy. He was a, he was a very, he walked like he talked, David. Seconds, also made in 1966, is the story of a man who opts for a second chance in life via plastic surgery. Seconds is the only picture that I've ever made that's gone from failure to classic without ever being a success. Jimmy was the best cameraman I've ever worked with. Um, he was the only cameraman that I've ever worked with. Well, Claude Renoir in France, too. But the only guy I've ever worked with that really helped me as a director. He really understood the script. He and I used to meet every Saturday at this Turkish bath, which Jimmy went to year after year after year, discussing the week's work and the whole thing. It was his idea to use the 9.7 millimeter lens. I learned a lot from Jimmy Wong Ho, and uh, his lighting I thought was great. We were totally in sync, he and I. Hey, John. <laughs> hey, John. What? Hey, John. <laughs> Hey, John, why are they staring at me like that? It was a strange movie. It was a movie that I originally wanted to use Laurence Olivier in both parts. And I came back having gotten Olivier to agree to do it, and then Paramount refused to finance the picture if Olivier played the parts because they didn't think he was a big enough star. Uh, someone proposed, his agent actually, proposed Rock Hudson. I thought that was a terrible idea. And he said, well, you have a, you, you owe it to yourself at least to meet him. He's the biggest star in the business. So I went up and met him. And he was the nicest guy I ever met. And I really was crazy about him. And uh, he said, well, of course, he said, if I did this, I could only play the part after the operation. And that had never occurred to me before, to use two actors. And then I thought about it, and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. And if you have to go through this horrible surus of operation after operation after operation, why not come out looking like... Time now to